a difficult question which through all my years of ministry has been tossed about and still people are dissatisfied in the different ranks of Adventism and that is the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and uh, that was in Matthew chapter 5 verse 32 a Sermon on the Mount this wonderful Mount of Blessings and yet this has caused all sorts of complications in the mind of many people and uh, here we read in Matthew 5 verse 32 it says verse 31 and 32 it hath been said whosoever shall put away his wife let him give her a writing of divorcement but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to commit adultery and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery this text has been a problem in the ranks of Christianity especially in these modern times and uh, the statement from the thought thoughts on the Mount of Blessing that is given by inspiration here is on in thoughts from the Mount of Blessing page 63 <clears throat> here it is written in that first paragraph there and right in the middle of the paragraph it says in the Sermon on the Mount Jesus declared plainly that there could be no dissolution of the marriage tie except for unfaithfulness to the marriage vow. And then in Adventist home that particular statement is qualified without any confusion whatsoever in Adventist home page 344 it says to this particular lady in reference to this particular lady I saw I saw that sister J as yet has no right to marry another man but if she or any other woman should obtain a divorce legally on the ground that her husband was guilty of adultery then she is free to be married to whom she chooses and up a little higher it says there is only one sin which is adultery which can place the husband or wife in a position where they can be free from the marriage vow in the sight of God then come all the different texts that arise in the Bible to say what sister white is saying doesn't seem to gel so we have a difficult question that needs to be answered and um, to gain a correct answer to such a difficult question is not gained by debate or discussion this is my title for our study here at the time not by discussion and I love that term because you'll see when I'm going to be reading it because I have been in debate and discussion on this and other subjects and I my soul is terribly constricted by this kind of method of learning truth and righteousness in Jesus Christ 
it doesn't achieve it. And yet, the questions must be resolved. And during my walk with God in, com commit com in, in, in dealing with those kind of debates, the Lord gave me wonderful answers and wonderful ways by which these problems can be solved. And that is what I hope to be able to do during this seminar time that we spend together. To gain a correct picture, we need to engage according to God's directive. God actually gives us the right ways by which we can resolve doctrinal questions and difficulties. And it is written in Proverbs 30, verses 5 to 6, there is an, a very important lead that when we read something in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, because the Bible is the word of God. We all agree with that. And what is the spirit of prophecy? It's the testimony of Jesus. The word of God is Jesus, isn't it? He is the word. And the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So as we read and as we research, we are dealing with what God, what Jesus is communicating. And here in Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6, is a very uh, important guideline. It says here in verse 5, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust. In him, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now what does this tell us? Every word of God is pure. So as I read a scripture... That word is pure. It doesn't need any interpretation. It doesn't need any adding to or taking away from. And that is the principle by which I have gained my understanding over the years. I have stuck very, very dearly to that principle. I will not change a single word in explanation of that scripture. Lest I be found a liar. And I don't know whether you've noticed, people do a lot of that. They say, oh, that doesn't exactly mean it like that. It means it's slightly different. Sorry, I cannot agree. Because every word of God is pure. And I cannot alter it, no matter how much I would like to. And I've been a person who's liked to change a lot of things. To suit my background and my opinion. But I can't. And neither can anyone else. They will be found a liar if we add unto his words. Or as it says in Deuteronomy, if we take anything from it. So if God has said it, if the testimony of Jesus has said it, it is so. And then if every statement I read, it is so, I need to get a correct um, understanding of that it's sometimes it, there's some things that appear obscure and difficult to try and put into place we go to Isaiah chapter 28 Isaiah chapter 28 and there we read verses 9 to 12 that as we read a statement from God's Word a thought a point of truth we don't rely on that statement alone to get a complete picture if I want to get that statement qualified it must be done like God has instructed us to verse 9 through to 12 St 
today yourselves and wonder, cry ye, and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. That's from uh, Isaiah 28. Sorry, I've been reading 29. I was over the page. But it's, it's connected as well. They are confused. <laughs> but here we come to Isaiah 28, verse uh, 9. It says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Right? We want to understand knowledge. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. In other words, mature. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. You are seeking for a resolution to a stressful debate. You are looking for a resolution to, to difficulties of, of interrelationships with people of different opinions. There is a conflict of knowledge, a conflict of doctrine. It says you want to find rest, you want to find knowledge, you want to understand doctrine then it must be by not changing a single statement of God's word, not altering it the slightest, but placing it next to other texts, placing it right through by precept upon precept, line upon line, and here a little and there a little, because that is what God has said he has spoken to us like. And he did it for a very special purpose. You can read about it further down because, as, he, as it says there in that statement in verse 12, yet they would not hear. There is a strong opinion in every sinful human being that even if God makes it clear, they're still going to reject it. And so he has put it in such a way that only the genuine seeker will find his way through the confusion. He will search for that hidden manner that's covered over by all this, this stammering lips in which God speaks. And so we are distinctly told that if we are going to come to a correct teaching, that we must search the scriptures like that, and correctly compare Scripture with Scripture, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2, Corinth, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And these words are so... So important, so crucial. In the light of what we've already said, don't change anything and read here a little and there a little. And then it says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So now we have a very clear principle here. In, if you read also verse 14, it says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Don't argue over the words. Don't argue the ins and outs of a particular statement. The statement reads as it reads. Don't try to fiddle it around. But study, rightly dividing each statement where it really belongs. 
And if you keep yourself strictly on that plan, you will come away with a wonderful, peaceful solution. And I know it to be true. I've done it every time. It never fails. But people who won't do it that way, who will go into all sorts of arguments over the little detail of the scripture or of that statement, find themselves in conflict continually with different minds. And there is no, as it says, it is to the subverting of the hearers. And how many people, in all my experience, have, have given up a simple, beautiful Christian walk because it has become so complicated by so many versions of interpretations. It's heart-sickening to me. And yet it's so simple when you follow these principles. This is the purpose of our seminar. To find rest and true peace because it is approved by God. We want to get behind God's approval, not human uh, scrutiny and human direction. This is what the church says, therefore it must be right. No, we must be approved of God. And God chooses which church is his, not we. And we can learn from him. Indeed, as we proceed, you will discover that I'm going to speak very little about the problem. I'm going to read very little about the problem that I just initiated here. I'm going to cover material that for a while you think, what's he doing? Why is he bringing this up? And why is he bringing the other one up? And why is he bringing... But if you follow very carefully, you need to pick up, with this backdrop of the question in your mind, you need to pick up the principles that are being established as we go through each particular uh, session in the seminar. You will be able to see a picture that is being painted from God's Word in reference to the issue at stake. And at the, as we come near the end of the study, and at the end of this study, I will take you through the subjects that we want to go through so you can get a little appreciation where we're heading. But we are going to experience God in our seminar. We're going to experience God's mind. We're going to look for it on this subject. Because we want to be among a people whom God approves. And in Isaiah 66, you can see the people that God approves. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2, and also verse 5. Because amongst human beings, conflicts arise, and churches and people fall apart. And here, as they fall, the, the ones that are in, in dominance want to rule over them and push them out. Notice the way it's written here, Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But now notice his approval. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. God, who does God approve? He who trembles at his word. He who is of a poor and contrite spirit and there you come to verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, you that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified. Praise the Lord, we've got rid of these heretics. But... 
He shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. You see, the people who tremble at his word, who do what it's written in Timothy, who take God's word and tremblingly and, and humbly accept exactly what is written there. They are not theologically argumentatively minded. They are not taking God's word as a, um, as a subject of debate. They are taking God's word as food for their soul. There lies the important issue. And people who do that, God will not leave them to flounder. Because they tremble at his word and he looks to them, he approves them. And others who are theologically orientated, who are orientated in making the scriptures a point of argument, they will be ashamed. They will be ashamed. Why is it that we should tremble at his word? Why should we? Why does God look to people who tremble at his word? Why? Come to Isaiah 55 and you read it there in verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. Because he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Is that a reason for trembling at his word? Obviously, if I'm trying to get hold of a thought that is way above mine and I'm going to make a definite mistake if I'm going to come at it from my own thoughts, then I'm trembling at his word. It's as simple as that. So to gain God's thought, to gain his way, is the objective in our research at this seminar. And... This cannot be done without painstaking, patient effort of waiting for here a little and there a little until the jigsaw puzzle comes together. You know what it's like sitting over a big jigsaw puzzle. I amazed, I'm amazed how people will patiently try to piece things together in a jigsaw puzzle. When it comes to God's word, they want to find quick answers. It is no different. And it's taken me quite a few years to get the picture together. And once you've got the picture together, and you hear the arguments, your brain goes, bzz, bzz, they're putting the wrong, places, wrong pieces in the wrong places. They're looking at the individual little bit and try to decipher it instead of looking at it as it connects. So, we, as we go through this seminar and a question arises in your mind that you would like an answer to, I don't mind if you ask me to, dis to just get some answers if you wish. However... If I don't answer you satisfactorily, it's because the answer is coming by the Word of God. And I'm going to be showing the Word of God in such a way that questions that you can hang on a hook will, will be taken off the hook eventually. But if you get a bit impatient, don't worry about asking. I'm, I'm happy if you ask. And I'll say, yeah, yeah, yep, that's coming there. Or, okay, here is something written and so on. I, it is important to... to, to Put questions into focus, um, and that's what we will be doing here. Don't be impatient about it. It's going to be by painstaking, patient effort of going through here a little and there a little until the answers dawn on you. That's the way it works. A very learned theologian once came to Jesus to engage in exactly what we are seeking to engage in. 
he came to Jesus at night time because he was a theologian and Jesus was just in the eyes of others just a, like so many theologians of today look upon others who are not, haven't gone through their college and Jesus never went to college remember he came there in John chapter 3 and uh, wanted to get into a discussion with Jesus John chapter 3, reading there from verses 1 onwards. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. What is he doing? He's patting Jesus on the back. Typical NLP. Typical NLP. Jesus knew exactly what he was up to. So what did he do? Jesus turned around and answered and said unto him, Truly, truly, verily I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You come to me, you want to get into discussion, sorry. Unless you become born again, you can't even see what I'm going to be telling you about. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? He's cynical here. He knew, he knew exactly what Jesus meant. But he was trying to put him off the track. But Jesus wouldn't let it happen. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus goes and says, Phew. How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. If I told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Remember, heavenly things are higher than man's thoughts. And here he is coming to Nicodemus who is coming to him to discuss the theological concepts that that he had been trained to do to find out from the teacher and Jesus knew he was going to waste his time because you can't answer a theologian unless the theologian is born again and starts all over again and uh, how can these things be says the theologian how can I tell you heavenly things that are higher than man's thoughts if you can't even understand what I'm telling you in regards to new birth. And here comes the beautiful magnification of this interview in Desire of Ages, page 167. Desire of Ages, page 167. And we read here in paragraph 1, It says, this is the whole chapter is beautiful. It deals with Nicodemus. Nicodemus held a high position of trust in the Jewish nation. He was highly educated and possessed talents of no ordinary character. And he was honored, an honored member of the National Council. With others, he had been stirred by the teaching of Jesus. 
Though rich, learned, and honored, he had been strangely attracted by the humble Nazarene. The lessons that had fallen from the Savior's lips had greatly impressed him, and he desired to learn more of, this wonderful, of these wonderful truths. So here he was, affected by education, by human intelligence, and, and affected by the strange atmosphere that was coming from Jesus. He wanted to find out some more. And there we come to page 171, and we read there in paragraph 1 onwards, there it says, Nicodemus had come to the Lord thinking to enter into a discussion with him. But Jesus laid bare the foundation principles of truth. He said to Nicodemus, It is not theoretical knowledge you need so much as spiritual regeneration. Theoretical knowledge is not going to give you spiritual regeneration. You need not have your curiosity satisfied, but to have a new heart. You must receive a new life from above before you can appreciate heavenly things. Until this change takes place, making all things new, it will result in no saving good for you to discuss with me my authority or my mission. Here you have a principle. A change of new birth, which as we go on through our seminar, you will see is a very rare experience in today's church experience. And if that's the case... Why? That answers a lot of the problems that churches have. Because it's such a rare experience. You'll hear me reading it. So it won't result in any saving good to enter into discussion while this has not happened. That's what Jesus said to him. And we come down to paragraph 3 and says, The figure of the new birth which Jesus had used was not wholly unfamiliar to Nicodemus. Converts from heathenism to the faith of Israel were often compared to children just born. Therefore, he must have perceived that the words of Christ were not to be taken in a literal sense. But he wanted to get into debate, you see. <laughs> That's what he was throwing up. But by virtue of his birth, as an Israelite, he regarded himself as sure of a place in the kingdom of God. He felt that he needed no change. Hence, his surprise at the Saviour's words. He was irritated by their close application to himself. Have you ever been irritated when somebody's trying to get something across to you and it just doesn't suit you? <clears throat> there he was. The pride of the Pharisee was struggling against the honest desire of the seeker after truth. There was something, he was, he was bipolar. He was proud, he was a Pharisee, and, and that pride of that pole uh, was struggling against the honest desire of the other side of the pole. He wondered that Christ should speak to him as he did, not respecting his position as a ruler in Israel. Surprised out of his self-possession, he answered Christ in words full of irony. How can a man be born when he is old? Like many others, like many others, when cutting truth is brought home to the conscience, he revealed the fact that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Always remember this in all our research of God's Word. If you rely on your natural perceptions, the natural man, you cannot receive it. There is in him nothing that responds to spiritual things. For spiritual things are 
spiritually discerned. But the Savior did not meet argument with argument. Did you pick that up? The Savior did not meet argument with argument. Isn't that usually the way that we get into studies? One person says that, no, there's another argument against it. And then, oh, no, no, there's another argument against that. And that's what Jesus never did. He did not meet argument with argument. Raising his hand solemnly, with solemn, quiet dignity, he pressed the truth home with greater assurance. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus knew that Christ here referred to water baptism and the renewing of the heart by the Spirit of God. He was convinced that he was in the presence of one whom John the Baptist had foretold. He began to realize, oh, oh here is somebody that can see me through and through. And so now Jesus continued and went into the detail of the discourse with him. And at the end of it all, when he ref referred to many different aspects, especially as the Israelites were in the wilderness and they saw the serpent on the stick and there he gave that beautiful description, now comes the principle of our seminar. Right here and now. On page 175, paragraph 1 to 3. He heard the spirit of prophecy just sort of brushes onto what he had talked to him about the serpents. Now notice, those who had been bitten by the serpents might have delayed to look. They might have questioned how there could be efficacy in the brazen symbol. They might have demanded a scientific explanation, but no explanation was given. They must accept the word of God to them through Moses. To refuse, to look, was to perish. In the word of God, frequently, that realization comes home. Here is what the word of God says. Just look at it. Don't begin to quibble about it. Because if you do, you're not going to be healed. The Word of God has been given for one purpose, to heal and to give us rest and peace. Not through controversy and discussion is the soul enlightened. There it is. Not through controversy and discussion is the soul enlightened. We must look and live. Nicodemus received the lesson and carried it with him. He searched the scripture in a new way. Not for the discussion of a theory, but in order to receive life for the soul. He began to see the kingdom of heaven as he submitted himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Can you see something very important here? It is not by tossing around scriptures by, by argument, in argument. It is not to study the word of God by establishing theoretical conclusions. It is so that we may look and live. There are thousands today, it goes on to reading, there are thousands today who need to learn the same truth that was taught to Nicodemus by the uplifted serpent. They depend on their obedience to the law of God to commend them to his favor. Remember, study to show yourself approved unto God. We study and examine this closely. This is what happens in the natural mind 
Yes, yes, I study even the gospel to try and get the gospel theologically right. And as I do that, I do it hoping that by doing it, I'm going to win the favor of God. When they are bidden to look to Jesus and believe that he saves them solely through his grace, they exclaim, how can this be? We can't get our head around that sort of process. We can only understand intellectually that if I get that statement there and uh, understand that statement on its own, uh, it, will, it will sort of, yeah, oh no, but that doesn't fit right, so I've got to change it a little bit. I can't stand when people do that. Like when my, in my search, research and, and, uh, and, and revealing of the beauty of the nature of Christ, when it says Christ was made in all points like us, he was made in sinful flesh, sin was in his flesh, and people go, no, 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 that doesn't mean exactly like that. It doesn't mean that sin was in the flesh. There's no such thing. And they try to explain it into something different. And yet it says, sin was in his flesh. What can I say? Debate? No, nope, sorry. Well, if you don't want to do it, well, okay, well, we must move on and tolerate each other. But it is to look and live that we need to study. So the, the, the churches that have established their creeds have established them on the basis of the way Nicodemus came to Jesus. And listen to what the Spirit of Prophecy says in Great Controversy, page 594. Page 594 in Great Controversy. <clears throat> there, um, it says, oh, I've got the wrong book, no wonder. 594 Great Controversy. Right at the bottom of the page, it says, the, the Apostle Paul declared, looking down to the last days, through to page 595, looking down to the last days. Are we there? We're in the last days? The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That time has fully come when E.G. White wrote that. The multitudes do not want Bible truth because it interferes with their desires of the sinful, world-loving heart. And Satan supplies the deceptions which they love. But God will have a people upon earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. Do you want to be that people? He will have them. But we have to study according to his approval. Here it is now. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, the general conference, that's an ecclesiastical council, as numerous and discordant as the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain 
Thus saith the Lord in its support. How clear do we want it? Don't add, don't take away. And if they're trying to study the word of God in their councils and come up to certain conclusions, that is not a clear support of everything that has been stated in God's word, but they've added or taken away, then I'm sorry. No matter how honorable they are, no matter how much they claim to be God's church, the voice of the majority does not necessarily mean it's right. Because it is built upon the majority in these last days not even being born again. Because the new birth is a rare experience in this generation. So how can I trust it? Very important meditation here. So, those who tremble at his word. We live in the last closing days of probation. We're not just living at the end where Sister White lived at that time. We're right at the very last closing days of probation. And today, believe me, and I think you've experienced a bit of it yourself, today we are living under a confusion. Daniel chapter 9 verse 7. I love the way it describes it. Daniel chapter 9 verse 7. It says, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are afar off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespasses and that they have trespassed against thee. What belongs to us? Confusion of faces. Daniel prayed like that. And it is very in the very near future that Amos chapter 8, verse 9 to 13, is the reality of the experience. Amos chapter 9, verse 9, sorry, chapter 8, verse 9. Amos 8, verse 9 to 13. How close we are to this you can only discover when you are actually ministering in the Word that there are so few people today who communicate the pure Word of God. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in a clear day. You know where we're living. This is the dark day has already happened, and here it goes on. And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. You know, this is such a, such a painful experience to watch. People are rejoicing, they're praising the Lord, and all of a sudden, boom, it's lamentation. <laughs> I thought that I had the truth. I thought that this was the church, and... Boom. And they can't sing joyfully, because every song they sing appears like a contradiction of terms to them I've gone through this many times and I will bring sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head and I will make it as the morning of an only son and the end thereof is a bitter day behold the days come saith the Lord God that I will send a famine in the land not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water but the hearing of the Words of the Lord. Hearing what God's opinion is. That is what is in the famine. It's the famine in the land. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. When that has happened, it's the close of probation. But how close is it already? 
How true is this that people travel from one side of the earth to the other hoping they can hear the word of God as it really is, as we have established in the beginning of our thought, that it is a thus saith the Lord because we take everything as it is written. And that's so rare today. So, the reason to tremble at his word is very vivid here. Am I going to be somebody that, wants, that, that, is, that is finding it so hard to find the pure word? I need to tremble at his word to make sure I get it right. So in patient humility, as we fellowship together, let us lay our opinions, our thoughts, our conclusions and deductions under the scrutiny of the Holy Spirit as under the latter rain. Are we living in the time of the latter, latter rain? What is written there in Deuteronomy 32, 1 to 4? Whose doctrine? Deuteronomy 32, the Holy Spirit's doctrine. Not the doctrines of the various different ecclesiastical um, uh, councils and all the majority and so on. No, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, 32 verses 1 to 4. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. I love this statement. You are all speaking, you are all declaring what you believe. I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. This is the outpouring of the latter rain. My doctrine, not human deductions, not human opinions. And here comes a very profound little statement from the spirit of prophecy, which uh, it incidentally is to do with, um, with our... Because we've laid aside the Sabbath school lesson today, but this is still Sabbath school. And here in uh, Testimonies on Sabbath School Work, on page 65, it says, Precious light is to shine forth from the Word of God. And let no one presume to dictate what shall or what shall not be brought before the people in the messages of enlightenment that he shall send. And so quench the Spirit of God. What did we read? My doctrine shall fall. If we are going to hear a message from the Holy Spirit and people have set their stakes on a certain interpretation, what hope have they got? Listen carefully. Whatever may be his position of authority... No one has a right to shut away the light from the people. When a message comes in the name of the Lord to his people, no one may excuse himself from an investigation of its claims. No one can afford to stand back in an attitude of indifference and self-confidence and say, I know what is truth. I am satisfied with my position. I have set my stakes. And I will not be moved away from my position, whatever may come. I will not listen to the message of this messenger, for I know that it cannot be truth. It was from pursuing this very course that the popular churches were left in partial darkness. And that is why the messages of heaven have not reached them. This is the story. That's Testimonies on Sabbath School Work, page 65. The first main paragraph. So, 
with this kind of understanding being played out before us in God's word, I read one more statement from Home Missionary, September 1, 1894. The truth will bear investigation. The more it is studied, the more will its light shine forth. God will move upon some of his faithful ones to do as Christ did. What did Christ do when he was upon earth? To brush away the rubbish and restore the truth in its appropriate setting in the framework of truth. What is this saying? People lock themselves into certain subject matters and they have covered it over with their particular opinionated doctrines and Jesus comes along and wipes the rubbish away and puts the particular points of truth in a framework that is a general picture not just a singular doctrinal argument and I have seen this sad story of people honing in on singular doctrines. You hear sermons being preached that is just a, a truth in, on its own, and you don't know where it fits in. This is not the way the Holy Spirit works. He brushes away the rubbish and puts the statements in such a frame that, oh, isn't that, oh, I never thought of that. And so this is the way that we wish to proceed together in research of the truth together. <coughs> to research it according to Christ's way of placing it in its appropriate setting in the framework of truth. And so this is our series that we want to go through. And last of all, I want to share with you that there is neither male nor female or marriage in heaven. And we're getting ready for that. And that will throw an amazing light on the whole subject. So may God help us to tune in to the framework of truth, not honing in alone on just one argument, but see it in its framework, and it will answer itself. May God bless us to this end is my prayer. Amen.